fade back in on Harborvale, a coastal town striving to rebuild. Its residents tread warily on the unsteady ground that has eroded beneath their feet. Despite the community's tenuous air of relief and recovery, there are still so many secrets to unveil. Secrets of an ancestral curse and the struggle to contain it. Secrets of vengeance biding their time. Secrets of alluring control washed onto the shore. Secrets of the beast within and the desire to release it. And as we tear back the veil of these silent secrets, we shall uncover the truth of what it requires to live beside the bay. Hello, and welcome to These Silent Secrets. My name is Taylor, and I will be your MC. Oh my god, everyone, it's so good to be back. Nicole and I are moved, we're in our place, we're set up, and life is hopefully a little bit back to normal. And with that means normal releases of this show. Thank you so much for everyone being so understanding that sometimes life gets a little weird. Um, but we're back, and we're starting back with a little introspection about the most recent events of the show. With that, we are back with part five of Monologues from a Monster. A little glimpse into the noggins of each of our wonderful soup groupies before we dive into whatever is coming next. Um, so, with that, before we dive in, of course, a bunch of thank yous to get through to Ghost Sight Media. Thank you for having us as a part of the network. We love you. We love being here. To uh, Nicole Tata Rob for all the incredible work she does at this show. She does so much, and we're so thankful, and it would not be nearly as good without all of her work, so thank you. To my cast, y'all are just cuckoo crazy banana pants, and I love every moment of it. Um, I love you all. Thank you for dealing with me as of late, because we it's been a mess, and I've been a little flabbergasted. So, thank you. Um, before we dive in, a content warning. This episode does have a moment of self-administered, like, injection with a syringe. So if that is a phobia for you or something triggering um i will make sure that a final timestamp for that is in the description so please check below please and thank you with all of that out of the way all that is left is the episode so let's dive into this episode of these silent secrets beside the bay violet a jarring and brutal thing a daily facet of so many's lives, and yet we as a people can never truly find a way to banish it from our society. Is it because of its mercurial nature? A thing that can take so many different forms spring from so many myriad causes, or because sometimes it can be so resounding that we find ourselves quite ill-prepared to counter it, its reach too big, its force too strong. When it comes to the violence our soup group has faced, we find that they have endured all of the above. And after an evening of barbecue at the Talbot's home, our favorite teens head out into the night with much on their minds. It's raining in Harborvale. Not that that should surprise me, but the heavy rain droplets splat on the sand around me, hard enough to make small valleys. I don't know why I came to this beach in the middle of the night. It's almost as if my feet started walking before my mind could catch up. But really, I know why my subconscious chose this beach. As I dig my fingers into the wet sand around me, I remember what makes this place so special. Julian took me here on what I would consider our first date. We were young. Narelle's age. Too young to be on a date. But I know Dad saw something I didn't at first, and when Julian asked to whisk me away for the evening, he just nodded. 
and went back to his work. I'll be here at sundown. You don't need to bring anything, I've got it handled, Julian said, his shoulders back and chest out, trying to sound like the kind of merman who asks a mermaid on an evening swim. He came to the house when the last sun rays were dissipating through the water, the golden hour getting caught in his hair. He held out his hand and asked if I was ready. He led us south, closer to the shore than I had ever been. Are you sure we should be going this way? I asked, looking behind me to see if Dad was following. You're gonna love it, Gup, Julian threw over his shoulder. I studied him as he swam ahead of me, his tail of midnight blue and shining in the moonlight. His shoulders were pressed back, making a deep crease down his center. His brown curls flowed behind him, reaching for me. I pushed myself harder to catch up to him and was rewarded with his grin and a dimple on his cheek. We didn't swim long before Julian stopped and announced we had arrived. We were close to the shore. I could see where the slope of the beach met the ocean floor. Not much longer, Julian assured me, and spun me by the shoulders to face away from him, toward the shore. Just keep your eyes on the surface. I wanted to throw a snark back at him, wanted to ask, what exactly are we doing here? As I turned to do just that, a small dot appeared in the corner of my eye, floating on the surface. Julian turned me back around and pointed. Is that? I trailed off because I truly couldn't believe what I was seeing. Leatherback turtle hatchlings. I found the nest a few days ago and knew I had to bring you here to see it. But they only hatch during a rainstorm, so I had to plan it just right. As he explained it, more hatchlings entered the water and floated down to us. Soon, we were surrounded by small turtles, their awkward, long front flippers moving frantically in the water as they learned how to swim. Julian and I helped a few, and supported them with our hands as they tested their new surroundings. I remember the laugh I let out, unbelieving and maniacal with excitement. It felt as though we were surrounded by shooting stars. The turtle hatchlings whizzed past us and deeper into the ocean, and I bid each one goodbye, until again, it was just Julian and me. Told you you would like it, he grinned. The memory plays in my mind again as I sit on the opposite side of it, my toes in the sand, instead of my tail swishing through the dark water. It's raining. I look for turtle hatchlings, but there are none. I have the dream again. I've had it every single time I've closed my eyes since then. I can't be sure it isn't Grim messing with me in my sleep, but I genuinely don't think it is. I think it's just me. The premise of the dream is always the same. It's me sla <sighs> slaughtering everyone I love. <sighs> I recognize what's happening, but I can't stop myself from doing it. I always know it's a dream, but another part of me isn't so sure. Like... What if I'm actually doing it this time? What if I've actually already done it, and I'm just reliving some memory? What if this is the precursor to me actually doing it? I always wake up in a cold sweat, my heart racing and my head pounding. I think I'm going to be fine, but then every time I close my eyes again, the blood is back. The premise is always the same, but the details change. They shift slightly, somewhat mercurial, but 
following the same pattern. In the dream, I'm getting better, more precise, more efficient. I'm faster, more fierce, more feral, more fun. I hate that. That some part of me enjoys the hunt, the kill, the coppery taste in my mouth and the pungent smell of death in the air. But if I'm being real, being honest, I think this started before Grimm. I think she just exposed and exploited something that was already there, just hiding from everyone, including myself, but now it doesn't want to hide anymore. I've been trying to stay myself, but I've noticed the change, and I'm sure everyone else has too. In the span of about a year, I went from never having even been in a fight to having killed how many people now? They won't ever come back because of my actions. I know my family would say it's in our nature, and I know my friends would say I didn't get anyone that didn't deserve to get got, but that doesn't change the fact that I ended lives. People with full lives and families and friends and people that cared about them and their own dreams and enjoyments and things that they wanted to do and now they don't get any of that because of me. Who says I get to be judge, jury, and executioner? Who says I get to say that someone deserved it? What gives me the right or the authority? And god damn it, why am I getting so fucking good at it it's almost a reflex at this point someone fucks with someone i care about time to teach them what dirt tastes like you enjoy hurting my friends <laughs> hope you enjoy being a corpse and some fucked up part of me enjoys this some primal part of my brain engages and releases dopamine and through the fear and adrenaline i feel this rush I don't even know how to explain it, like something feels just right, and that I should be doing this, and that this is where I belong, and that I was meant for this, and I'm so fucking good at it, and I just gotta get better, and better, and then someday I'll be perfect, and then after I come down, I just feel fucking scared, because because what am I becoming? What have I already become? I'm not supposed to be scary or intimidating or violent. <laughs> I mean, look at me. I'm the nerd that's supposed to get good grades, prep for college, worry about quizzes and tests. I show up for volleyball and I'm not super duper athletic, but I give my all to the team. I'm supposed to play video games with my friends. That cause a ruckus. Most importantly, I'm supposed to make my family proud and make my friends happy. But I also wonder, is what I'm becoming making my family proud? They've always loved the wolf, the hunt, the feel of the wind in our fur, the taste of a fresh kill in our teeth. They've always wanted me to embrace the wolf, but like this? Is it making my friends happy? Do they like what I'm becoming? Are they okay with this? I mean, I'm eliminating threats that impede on their lives, removing stressors for everyone, solving the problem, quote unquote, in the most direct way possible. But. When this is all over, will they still be proud? Will they be happy? Will they like who I am or want me in their lives? Will, will they still love the beast I've become? I let her get away. 
But I think the important part about that is that I let her do that. Right? She's not the one in control anymore. And I've realized that, y you know, we've been, we've been trying to hunt her down. We've been trying to find Nadia, figure out what she's doing, and put a stop to it. And I think, I think that maybe we're working too hard. Because this, this whole deal with the school, what it tells me is that we don't have to go find her, right? If we wait long enough, and not even that long probably, not just just gonna come to us. And she's gonna be on like our turf, you know? She's gonna show up at our school, the place, one of the places that we know the best. Is that, I mean, it's unsettling that she, you know, is taking pot shots at students. That's pretty fucked up. And we're putting a stop to that. But if that's what she's having to resort to at this point, to be able to try to get something out of me, like a rise or a reaction or anything, that feels like she's desperate. And we have information on her. We have information about Sergey. And she knows we have that. And I think she's worried. Which feels great. It honestly feels so nice to know that Nadja is worried about us. I don't know what I would do if I actually, if we actually found Sergey. I don't know. As far as we know, he's just like a kid, so, you know, it's not his fault that Nadja is the way that she is, but Nadja doesn't need to know that, I guess. But we're the ones in control now, which means that we don't only get to beat Nadja. We don't only get to take her down. We also, we also get to embarrass her. We get to make her feel small. We get to make her feel like she's not in control anymore. And I think that's what's most important to her. I wanna bring her down. And not just in like the normal sense of the phrase, like I wanna defeat her. I wanna bring Nadia down. I want her to be at her lowest. I want her to know she's lost and for her to beg for a way out and for me to not even hear it happen. It's a little unnerving saying that about a person but I feel like she's earned it and I feel like I've earned a little bit of extra satisfaction so Nadja I know you're not listening to this because it's a thought that I'm having but just in case you've got some weird soup that taps you into the broadcast, we'll be waiting. I was 10 when it happened. I was walking home from school and it just hit me like a gust of wind, but colder, heavier. I saw this kid from my class, Cole, and I could feel everything he was afraid of. I didn't just know that he was scared of the dark, like he said in class, but I could see the monsters lurking in the shadows of his mind. His guilt over stealing that comic from the corner store, his grief 
from when his dog died last summer. It flooded me all at once. I remember stumbling back, trying to breathe, but it was like his fears had wrapped around my chest and squeezed. And then everything went dark, and when I came to, I wasn't in my body anymore. I was above, looking down at him from the air, wings flapping in the sky. I, I don't know how long I was up there. A minute? An hour. But when I landed, I wasn't me. I, I was, I was this, I, I was the raven. I ran straight home and I went and talked to my grandma because I knew that she'd understand. She always had this way of understanding things. She was calm, too calm. She sat me down at the kitchen table, eyes darker and more serious than I'd ever seen them, and she told me stories. Stories about how her life had been hell because of this curse. And she didn't sugarcoat it. How the town blamed her grandma for everything, broken marriages, family secrets, nightmares that left people screaming in the night, all because she could see their worst sides. Their hidden truths and nightmares were just part of the package. This isn't something to be proud of, she said. It's a curse. <laughs> you think they understand. You think that they'll see you and think, oh, how special. But no, they, they will hate you like they hated my grandma, like they hated me. You need to keep this buried, Avery. You need to hide what you are. Her words sank in deep. She made it sound like it wasn't just the town that hated the raven, but that she hated it and that I should hate it too. So I listened. I buried it. I tried to forget about it, but... I never could. And for a long time, I believed her. I mean, I was just a kid, right? And when your grandma tells you something like that, it sticks. So I did what she said. I shoved it down. I pretended like it never happened. And whenever that strange pull would start, like that tug deep in my chest, like the raven wanted out, I ignored it. I swallowed it whole. I convinced myself that it was just some weird dream that I had as a kid, just a fluke. It wasn't me, it wasn't a part of who I was. But the thing about burying something that big is that it doesn't stay buried. It creeps back up like weeds pushing through the cracks in the pavement. By the time I hit high school, it was impossible to ignore. I'd be sitting in class minding my own business and suddenly I'd feel the fears of everyone around me. Like a wave crashing over me. Flooding my head with their worries, their guilt, what their parents thought about last night, what kept them up, staring at the ceiling. I couldn't escape it. And then there were the nightmares. I mean, the ones that I, I didn't even mean to cause. They just started happening around the people that I spent the most time with. First, my friends would complain about bad dreams, intense, terrifying things they couldn't shake, and then the dreams would start looking a lot like the things that I knew they feared most. It wasn't long before I realized I was the one doing it, even if I didn't want to. Now that I think back to it, I guess I was lucky that someone like Jason wasn't tasked with taking care of my little problem once and for all. Part of me clung to what Grandma had drilled into me, that this raven wasn't something to embrace, that it was this curse, and I didn't want to be hated. But another part of me, I, God, I don't know, it was curious. This power wasn't just some dark cloud looming over me. I mean, there were moments 
brief, but real, when I felt like I could use it. Like I could do something with it, help people, maybe make them confront their truths instead of hiding from them. And the older I got, the harder it was to see it the way that Grandma did. She was so afraid of it, but I, I couldn't help but wonder, was it really the power itself that was so bad or just how it was used? I wanted to believe that it could be more. I mean, every time I tried to talk to her about it, she shut me down and told me I was being reckless or naive. I mean, she said people would always hate what they didn't understand and that nothing good would ever come from embracing this part of myself. I guess even after all this time, I'm still trying to figure it out. I mean, part of me is afraid she's right. That I'll end up just like her. Alone. Bitter. Trapped by this thing inside of me. But another part of me still thinks that it can be a gift. But only if I'm brave enough to make it one. Across town, we see Nadja Schofield as she stumbles bloodily into the small stat care facility. She marches past the check-in desk to the back, moving quickly through the hallway. She snags an instant ice pack off of a counter along the way, popping, shaking, and placing it to her bleeding head as a stout, balding man with a beard enters the space. Um, Miss Schofield, looking nervously at her wounds. We'll get you patched up right- Give it to me, she cuts off. <laughs> Uh, ma'am, respectfully, the formula is still quite volatile. I, I really wouldn't recommend. Nadja whips the ice pack at the man. Did I ask your opinion? I said, give it to me. The man disappears for a moment, returning with a capped syringe. Uh, a nurse will be here momentarily to administer. Before he can finish, she grabs the syringe, uncaps it and sticks the needle into the side of her neck. She presses the plunger and steadies herself. She looks down the barrel of the camera, and as she does, we see a luminous orange take over the whole of her irises. She breathes out through her nose, and as she does so, steam emerges from her nostrils, and we fade out. Thank you so much again for listening to this episode of These Silent Secrets. If you liked what you heard and you want to support us, but guess what? There's so many ways that you can do that. Super duper easy ones. Wherever you're listening to us right now, if you can just scroll down, leave us um, you know, a rating or subscribe, um, whatever the options there are. Um, a big one that we would love is if you have a couple moments to give us a review of some sorts. Kind words lead to kind people listening to our program and that's all we really want another super duper easy way is just to talk to a couple people about us you know people are looking for podcast recs let us just let them know let them know about us um you know you guys talk about how much you love the show and then they'll tell a bunch of people about how much they love the show and it's just a big like verbal group hug and i think that's what the world needs now is love sweet love I'll never sing for you guys again, I promise. Um, if you want to support us further, you can check us out over on Patreon at patreon.com slash ghostlightmedia. For two bucks a month, you'll never notice it. You can come be a part of our private Discord server where you can hang out with me, all of the other members of TSS, as well as all of the ever other members and fans of Ghostlight Media. So that's a lot of bang for your buck. You can also check out our merch store at tpublic.com slash stores slash ghostlight. Get yourself some awesome merch. I recently found out you can get these very nice, like, lightweight crew neck sweatshirts, and I need, like, 20,000 of them. So go check that out. You can find us all over the internet. We have our website at thesilentsecrets.com. We are on TikTok and Blue Sky at These Silent Secrets. We're over on Twitter slash X at Silent Secret Pod. And you can find all of us individually. You can find Marcus at Marcus RVO, Nicole at Nicole Voice, Mariah at underscore Mariah Clausen, Freddie at Freddie underscore Pow Pow, and myself at T Tuts Voice. We'll be back in two 
weeks with another episode, but until then, may your secrets stay hidden. And may your own moments of self-reflection and introspection lead you to somewhere warmer, folks. I love you. Goodbye. This has been a Ghostlight Media production.